Hi, this is Dr. Justin Essery. This is week eight of PolySci 509, the linear model. And today we're going to continue talking about violations of the classical linear normal regression model. Uh, last week we talked about three common violations of the CLNRM assumptions and what consequences those violations might have uh, for your regression analysis. Uh, here you can see those three topics from last week. Uh, the first one was heteroscedasticity. Uh, which in plain language just means a uh, non-constant error variance in the regression. Uh, and this was a concern when the uh, variance of the uh, regression u was correlated with one of the regressors x. And when this happened, we had an efficiency problem. The standard errors of beta, uh, the estimated betas from the regression could be too big or they could be too small and we wouldn't necessarily know which. Uh, very often uh, those standard errors are too small, meaning that our uh, uh, estimates were overly confident and we would reject the null hypothesis too often. Uh, and we talked about a number of uh, corrections for that problem, including various heteroscedasticity consistent VCV matrices. Uh, we talked about omitted variable bias, which I don't think I need to even write a note here because it is exactly what it sounds like. It's the bias in uh, beta estimates that occurs when um, a model is misspecified. And as we discussed, uh, the misspecification of a model, specifically leaving out um, one of the necessary components of the regression, leaving out a regressor, uh, is only a problem if the omitted regressor is correlated with the, uh, both the dependent variable and the independent variable that you're truly interested in. So control variables uh, are, are often included in regressions, but sometimes they're omitted because we don't even know they belong or because we can't collect them. Um, that is a problem if and only if the omitted regressor, the omitted core, uh, control variable is highly, well, really at all, but especially highly correlated with the independent variable that we truly care about. Uh, and then finally, uh, multicollinearity. Uh, was a problem that we discussed uh, last week. Uh, multicollinearity is, uh, in, in plain language, a correlation among the uh, x variables. So um, the problem here is all of our x's are correlated or possibly correlated with each other, so a correlation among the regressors. Correlation among regressors. And as we saw, this creates a real problem when the regressors, the x variables, the independent variables are so correlated with each other that we can't really tell the difference between them. And we, in, in particular, can't tell the difference in how they influence y. So multicollinearity uh, obscures our ability to differentiate the causal or correlational relationships uh, between each individual independent variable and the dependent variable. And as we saw, this is really a problem when multicollinearity reaches a very high level, let's say around 0 0.9, 0 0.95. Um, at lower levels of multicollinearity, it can be a bit of a problem, uh, but not, as, not quite as big a one. Uh, so this week, we're going to continue with two different violations, uh, measurement error and endogeneity, and we'll talk about what each of those means in the lecture. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we're going to find that these violations are, are, are both more consequential in some ways and also harder to fix than the last three that we examined. But nevertheless, we'll have some suggestions. I'll have some suggestions to advance, uh, some things that you can do. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. First uh, topic we're going to deal with today is measurement error. And uh, I've written down here what may appear to be a somewhat silly question. Uh, what is measurement error? Well, uh, it's the error you make when you measure something, you measure it wrong. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll get a little bit more technical about it though. So uh, let's presume that the true DGP uh, looks a little something like this. So here's the true data generating process. It looks like Y0 equals X0 beta uh, plus U0, okay? So uh, we actually observe and run, so we run a model that looks like this but isn't quite this. We run y equals x beta, okay? So we're estimating u0 with u hat. So if you want, you can put in the x beta hat plus u hat kind of thing here. Um, but actually, I'm gonna leave it the way it is because 
the important bit here is that y is not y0, it's y0 plus v, where v is a measurement error term. And x is x0 plus w, and v and w are measurement error terms. Now, these measurement errors are uh, typically presumed to be um, benign in the sense that they're, for example, independently and identically distributed and mean zero, uh, meaning there isn't necessarily a consistent bias in measurement. We could incorporate that if we wanted, but uh, very often it's just assumed that this is pure noise, noise in, in data collection. So if we were to uh, uh, take these measurements and substitute and solve, what we would get is y0 plus v. So we're taking this and substituting it in right here. y0 plus v equals x0 plus w beta plus u0, or plus, let's say u0. So I'm going to put in the u0 term here. So now we're putting in this and substituting that right here. I'll actually make, I'll make that two lines, make that two, make that three, three. So we're putting that, we're putting that in there, the three line and the three line and the two line and the two line. Uh, now, substitute and solve, what do we get? Well, I can rearrange this term to be y0 equals uh, x0 beta plus w beta uh, plus u0 minus v. So this, let me get a red pen here. So uh, this right here uh, is a mishmash of error components. Um, measurement error terms and uh, ca uh, causal error terms, as it were. And uh, we can't necessarily figure out um, what these things are. For example, we don't observe W. It's a measurement error term. So we can't determine the term W beta. Uh, we can't determine U0. Um, it's an unobserved error term. All, but we, all we could ever hope to do is estimate it in a perfectly specified model. And V is a measurement error term. We can't see this either. So all of this stuff in our regression sort of ends up as estimated error. It's all estimated error together, U hat. Um, and as you might imagine, this causes a problem because you notice that this estimated error component is correlated with some things. It's correlated in particular with beta. Um, so if w is non-zero, we might have a problem there. And we might have a problem uh, in estimating, um, we might have a problem if v is non-zero because v is correlated with y. So we could have components of the error correlated with a dependent variable. We'd have components of the error correlated with estimated regressors, I'm sorry, estimated uh, coefficients sizes. Uh, so as you might imagine, uh, from the two things I just described, there are some consequences to measurement error in the OLS context. Some are less pernicious than others. Uh, we'll start with the, the, the least pernicious, which is just uh, simple inefficiency. Inefficiency. Uh, so uh, the estimated error term u uh, or the, actually I should say the composite error term u is, consists of the original error term from the correctly specified model plus the w beta term minus the v term uh, and therefore uh, the variance of that error term u and we'll say the variance of the estimated error uh, u hat is 1 over n minus k u hat transpose u hat whoops, I got that wrong Uh, which is going to be greater than the variance of the original error component u0. So in other words, if we had no uh, measurement error and we estimated the model um, with no error and we therefore got an estimate of u0, and actually this is going to be the, really the variance of the estimated u0, its variance is going to necessarily be less than our estimate of u hat which is going to include not just u0, but all of these other terms that are getting wrapped up in it. In other words, when we make measurement errors, those measurement errors get captured or, or absorbed into the uh, regression error term, and therefore the regression error term just gets bigger. And so when we calculate the variance 
of, of that bigger error term, we get bigger variance. Uh, the, the practical consequence of this is that the standard errors of the beta coefficients uh, are inflated. Uh, because, as you may recall, um, the variance covariance matrix of beta comes out of u transpose u, or u hat transpose u hat. Uh, actually, it comes out of u hat u hat transpose. My apologies. So, bigger u hats mean bigger standard errors of beta, which means harder to reject the null. Uh, then it would have to be. Um, an optimal estimator would reject uh, false negatives. Uh, I'm sorry, let me put that another way. An optimal estimator without measurement error, um, in other words, an optimal model that excluded any measurement error, would have fewer false negatives than this one would because it would have smaller, uh, smaller standard errors, smaller, uh, smaller standard errors of beta. Uh, that's that's all bad, but comparatively not so bad because certain types of measurement error can actually give us uh, even bigger problems. In particular, we can get bias in beta coefficients uh, as a result of measurement error. Uh, how do we get bias in beta coefficients as a result of measurement error? Uh, well, you may remember that the unbiasedness proof of beta in the classical linear regression model relies on a particular assumption. So the CLRM relies on the expectation of u given x equaling zero, but the expectation of our composite error term given x now is uh, the expect. Uh, I should put an expectation term here. Get rid of that. Is uh, now the expectation of the original error term plus w beta uh, minus v. given x0 plus w, because x is x0 plus this measurement error. So now we can break this into three parts. The expectation of u0 given x0 plus w. Uh, the expectation of w beta given x0 plus w. And uh, the expectation of v given x is 0 plus w. Actually, I should subtract that there. Uh, well, OK. I can probably say you know u0 is uncorrelated with x0 or w, so I can get rid of that. And same for v. Measurement error in y is probably unrelated to x0 or, or measurement error in w. But this third term, you know, I, the expectation of w given w is not 0. It's w, so uh, this term is non. This term right here is non-zero. Uh, therefore, the expectation of u given x is w beta, which is not zero. So what this is telling us is that if we have measurement error in x, oops, Measurement error in x uh, results in a bias problem. Uh, whereas measurement error in y uh, results in efficiency problems only. So if we make mistakes measuring the dependent variable, we can expect our standard errors to be too large, and we can expect to reject the uh, null hypothesis a bit too often, have too many false negatives. But if we mess up in measuring x, the regressors, not only will we get um, efficiency problems, which I should say are still wrapped up in that, but more to the point, we get bias problems. We, get, we can get incorrect estimates in, in beta hat, which will give us uh, answers are, that are too big. We can say that re the relationship between x and y is too big or too small. And uh, uh, I, sh I should say, typically, measurement error biases beta downward. Um, I could maybe think of some special cases where it would bias it upward, but the usual case is that it biases it downward, if I recall correctly. 
Uh, so, uh, in short, if you have measurement error in X, you have a, a, a big, a really big problem uh, to, to deal with. Uh, that's 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 a that is a very bad thing. Uh, so now we would ask, we could ask, uh, how do we deal with that? Well, we'll talk a little bit about how to deal with it. But before we do that, first I want to give you some applied examples in R showing you how this works. So I've given you some formal intuition about why measurement error can, can cause a problem. Uh, now what I want to do is give you some uh, actual uh, simulation evidence, some applied evidence, so to speak, that, that this is a problem. So I've prepared a, an R script here that you can follow along with. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, remove everything from the from the uh, memory and set my seed equal to one two three four five six. So they all get the same answer, and I'm going to generate a data set x and y. And as you can see, x and y come out of a uh, very simple classical linear normal model. Um, there's a normally distributed error term, and the DGP is two plus three x. Uh, so if I run a regression on this data, this is a data set of size a hundred. Uh, you can see that we more or less recover the DGP in this little sample data set of size 100. Uh, we're supposed to get 2 plus 3x, we get 1.8 plus 3x. Great. Close enough. Uh, now what we want to do is I'm going to add a normally distributed error term onto y and see what I get. And based on what I just showed you, I expect the standard errors of both these coefficients to go up. So I'm actually going to expand this bottom pane a bit so you, we can look at these uh, together. When I run this regression, okay, uh, this is with a normally distributed error component on Y only. Now what happened? The standard errors on both the intercept and X grew. The standard error on the intercept went from 0.19 to 0.33. The standard error on X went from 0.03 to 0.05. Now these were already highly statistically significant quantities and so we still didn't get the false negative that we were a little bit worried about, uh, probably because the signal was so strong and this data set was large enough for it not to matter. Nevertheless, you can sort of see how this is could possibly cause a problem. Uh, now, on the other hand, if I put error term, a normally distributed error term on X, now we've got bigger problems. We're getting a DGP of 1 plus 2X instead of 2 plus 3X. And again, this is the attenuation bias that I alluded to earlier. Typically, measurement error results in attenuation bias. The, the betas are, are, are too small, well, which is bad news if you're trying to reject null hypotheses. And you know, Well, it's just generally bad news if you want to know what's happening in your data set, but uh, as a practical matter, it could interfere with your ability to, to draw proper inferences and could result in more false negatives and all that stuff. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a formalized simulation where I repeat this process many, many times. I'm just going to draw a bunch of beta coefficients. Specifically, I'm going to draw a thousand different data generating processes. And I'm going to estimate three models. Um, one that puts the error on X, one puts error on Y, and one that, that uh, doesn't uh, put error on either uh, uh, element of the model. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, summarize the confidence intervals. Um, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to capture the confidence intervals uh, for both the intercept and um, the uh, actually I take that back I'm going to only look at the confidence intervals on the X coefficient and I'm going to capture two um, aspects of that of that confidence interval first whether it covers the true beta so I'm going to look at whether the 95% confidence interval uh, covers the beta, the true beta coefficient 95% of the time. That's question one. Question two is I'm going to look at how wide those confidence intervals are. And with 95% coverage, narrower is better. So CI is whether I have beta um, included in my confidence interval. CI WID is the width of the confidence interval. So I'm going to do this for a whole bunch of different um, cases and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at what we get. So you can see my simulation is merely running away here and hopefully I'll be able to get some answers consistent with what I told you. So go, 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 and you're done. Okay. So uh, bias CI and CIWD are for the models not including the um, error term. So going back up to the simulation code, you can see uh, the bias I is beta 2 minus summary model and the coefficients. This is a model, um, where's a model right here, y given x. So this is with no measurement error on y or x. 
And going back down to the results here, what we can see is the average bias is 0 .0004, 0 .0004, so very, very tiny, pretty much close to zero. Uh, we cover the 95, uh, the 95 uh, confidence interval covers the true beta 94% of the time, so very close to the nominal alpha level. And the mean width of the confidence interval is 0.137. That's in the in the terms of the, in the units of the original beta. So 0.137 units of slope. Uh, now the y error um, part of the simulation, which you can see up here at the top of the code, just is the same thing except when we run the model, we've added a normally distributed error component to y. This is y plus r norm 100 blah 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 standard error of three. So when I run this uh, y error, these three y error measurements, what we should expect to see is uh, that first, still we should have a bias of near zero, and we do, um, 0.001, it's slightly more biased, but probably not enough to worry about. Uh, the 95% CI covers the uh, true beta 94.3% of the time, so that's good news. Again, not much different from the uh, model with no measurement error at all. Uh, but the width of the confidence intervals is greater, 0.2471, as opposed to 0.1379. So our confidence intervals are, are consistently wider um, when we have error on uh, the y um, component of the, on our dependent variable. Uh, in other words, we're going to get less confidence in our estimates. We're going to be able to say less about the relationship between x and y if we measure y with error. But if we measure x with error, and you can see X, this x error term is just that same stuff, except now we're putting error terms on a normally distributed error term on x instead of y. It creates this xx thing here, which is just x plus some error. Uh, now we've got some issues. Uh, so coming down here, you can see that the mean bias is 0.413. That means on average uh, we're uh, we are overestimating um, the beta co or I'm sorry that we're underestimating the beta coefficient by 0.41. So you can see. Um, the bias is calculated by beta minus the estimate, so the estimate being smaller means that this bias term is going to come out positive. So we're underestimating beta by about 0.41. That's the attenuation bias to which I referred, and it's bad. Uh, the um, confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals, cover the true beta 1% of the time. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, so the 95% CIs are not an accurate reflection of what's going on at all. And the confidence intervals are super wide, uh, 0.3446. That's a very wide confidence interval, wider even than the error on, on, um, on the uh, models that had the error on the dependent variable. So we're getting confidence intervals that are too wide, um, downward biased, and don't cover the true beta. That's the trifecta of not good. So uh, measurement error on x is a really bad thing. And uh, bigger n doesn't solve the problem. So all these models you can see up here in the code are run on um, uh, samples of size 100. You can see x is drawn out of the uniform from uh, 100 samples of the uniform distribution. Suppose we bump that up to 1,000. This is data sets of size 1,000. So if I just rerun this exact code doing nothing but changing the, uh, the, the uh, sample size to 1,000. In fact, I'm even using the same seed uh, for the random uh, number generator so that the random component of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the simulations is the same, just to update the samples. Here are all the reports of my results. Now, you can see that for the Y error and no error models, I'm basically getting the same answers. Very little bias, very narrow confidence intervals. 95% um, coverage is really 95% coverage. But I want you to focus on these X error terms because that's where we had the biggest problems before. And what you can see is uh, I've still um, got 0.4255 um, underestimate bias. So in other words, I'm supposed to be getting, let's see the true betas here. Where are the true betas? The true betas are well. Here are the true betas. I should just be able to cover them. B. Yep. 1.877 and 1.36, and on average, I'm underestimating uh, this x beta. This is the second one by uh, 0.4255. That's a little under 50% underestimation. 
Um, so, bad. Uh, I'm not covering it at all with my 95% sea ice. And again, my, uh, comp non my confidence intervals are mm, about twice as wide as the uh, confidence intervals with no error at all. Actually, they're more than twice as wide as the confidence intervals coming out of the model, no error at all. So, uh, simply collecting tons and tons of data will not fix a measurement error problem, uh, which is uh, sad, but important to know. So now comes uh, the inevitable question, uh, what do we do about measurement error uh, as a source of problems for our regression? Uh, and of course, uh, there's the simple answer, which is, uh, you know, don't make measurement errors. Uh, okay, um, that's fine. Uh, one could say, yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> If I'd have done it, I just wouldn't have made the errors. Fine. Uh, but very frequently, we actually aren't in control of the data collection process to begin with. Uh, we may be using secondary data, some other author's data. We may be trying to replicate or do, a, do a, uh, an original analysis on pre-collected data. Uh, never, you know, For all these reasons and others I can't think of at the moment, often just saying make fewer errors is not really uh, a viable option. Although it's certainly good uh, to think about um, whenever you are engaged in original data collection. Although even when you are, probably some level of error is inevitable. Uh, given that just saying don't do it is not necessarily the most helpful, um, uh, helpful solution, we could also say, well, given that it's inevitable, we can maybe do some things to, to, to mitigate the problem. And uh, one of the biggest things we can do is try uh, collecting multiple measurements. So uh, what do I mean by collecting multiple measurements? Uh, well, it's exactly what it, what it sounds like. Um, each of these individual measures I'm thinking about are all flawed, uh, maybe. Uh, but together, um, they're actually, uh, we can get more out of them than we get out of any single flawed measure. Uh, so consider, for example, a simple mean of m many measurements of the same concept. And I'm just going to put them on the same scale for the moment. One could rescale them or, or standardize them to sort of force them all to be on the same scale if you wanted to, which is probably going to be necessary if you want to take a mean of these m many measurements. Uh, according uh, to the CLT, the Central Limit Theorem, uh, the probability limit as m goes to infinity, that's m, not n, so m is the number of uh, measurements, not the uh, size of the sample. Uh, the p lim as m goes to infinity of the variance of 1 over m sum from i equals 1 to m, or cap m, so m is the total, or no, 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 it's little m, sorry. i equals 1 to little m. Uh, xi equals 0. So if I have m many measurements, and they're all flawed, and I just take a simple average of those m measurements, the more and more measurements I get, the variance in those measurements goes to zero. Uh, gets smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually goes to zero. Uh, furthermore, uh, where am I? So, uh, p lim m goes to infinity of uh, one over m sum from i equals one to m x i equals mu i equals x i zero. So the mean of m many flawed estimates will approach the true value of the underlying concept as the number of flawed measurements gets larger and larger and larger. Uh, so this is, what I'm essentially saying here is if you have crappy measurements, it's good to have a lot of them because I can just average those crappy measurements and assume that they're assuming that they're all unbiased crappy measurements then the only problem is just noise in the measures um, the more and more bad flawed measures I get 
the uh, better and better uh, that I can get at extracting the signal, the true value of the underlying measure out of, the, uh, out of those flawed measures. So you can see that in the simulation I prepared. I'm gonna uh, give, me, give myself a little bit more room here so I can show you what I'm doing. Um, so uh, I've got some kind of concept X here um, and uh, I'm gonna draw 100 samples out of that X and, or I'm gonna draw 100 uh, observations, I should say. Uh, out uh, of x here. So this is my true x value. And uh, then I'm going to create five noisy measurements. So x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5 are all noisy measurements of x. There are x plus some randomly distributed error with standard deviation, normally distributed error with standard deviation of 3. If I uh, run a model, so first of all I should say, oh, the, the model, the true DGP is y equals 2 plus 3x plus a normally distributed error term. If I use only one of these measures of x to estimate a model, I'm going to get a biased uh, estimate. So I should be getting 2 plus 3x. If I use only x1 to measure x, I get uh, 2.5 plus 3x. If I, I'm sorry, I get 3, 2.75, 2 and 3 quarters, plus 2.5x. So I'm getting the attenuation bias. If I use x2, I'm getting 2 plus 2.7x, so a little closer to the true value of 3x, but no, not, not really that great. Uh, if I just use x3, I get 1.5 plus 2.29x, so again, drastic attenuation bias there. Uh, 2.16 plus 2.39x. All of these individual models using the, the, the bad measures of x are all kind of equal equally bad. They're all a little bit different in their badness, but they're all attenuated in terms of estimating the true relationship between x and y. Uh, but suppose I bind these x measures together and I calculate a mean of all these bad measures. So what I'm doing is taking these five x measures and extracting a mean for each one, for each observation. So, and I'm calling that double x. So double x is the average of these five bad measures. If I run a model of the average of the five bad measures against y, I'm getting 2 plus 2.85x. That's pretty darn good. In fact, if I run a model with the original data, y given x, with no error whatsoever, uh, sorry, I forgot to type in the ln part. Uh, lm, there we go. Uh, I get 2.25 plus 3x. So I'm actually not doing too much worse than I um, than I could do with the true data with no measurement error at all. And the more measures of x I got, the closer and closer my uh, averaged estimate would get to the true uh, data generating process, or at least more accurately, the closer and closer it would get to the model I could get having the true underlying measures of x and y for any given sample size. Uh, so the upshot of all this is, you know, if, if you have to have bad measures, uh, the best thing to have is a bunch of bad measures, because um, then at least maybe you can extract uh, a common signal out of them uh, by taking a simple mean. Uh, another approach that we're not really going to cover in great depth in this class, but I just want to genuflect toward it because it, it should come up uh, in your later training, is uh, if you have multiple measures uh, of x and they're all flawed, uh, you could think about using factor analysis to extract the common principal component. Um, or it's also sometimes a factor analysis is called principal components analysis. These two things are some, there are some, they're broadly speaking the same thing, but there are lots of sub techniques of how to do it. And sometimes principal components analysis is distinguished from old style factor analysis. Nevertheless, factor analysis or principal components analysis is a way of extracting a common signal. Um, out of multiple different measures. Uh, in particular, it looks for, um, if you have k measures, it will try to extract k different principal components or signals out of that uh, combination of k measures. Uh, and if there's only really, if you have k measures and there's only really one signal, what you'll see is that the first principal component will be very dominant. It'll be, it'll sort of dominate, it'll, it'll be the strongest signal you can extract from these k measures and all the other ones are kind of be just noise. Um, so without going into great depth about what we're talking about here, because it's, it's not really 
OLS material uh, or linear model material, it might be important to look into the uh, idea of factor analysis if you had many measurements and you suspected that they were all measures of the same thing but that each one was individually noisy. So something to think about if you uh, have an applied project. Uh, now I want to talk about the second problem that I pointed out uh, for today, uh, endogeneity. And uh, endogeneity is uh, pretty easy to explain and pretty hard to fix. Uh, well, let's start off with just explaining what endogeneity is. Uh, so uh, suppose we've uh, got a model and we've up to this point kind of been assuming the following model between x and y. Uh, x causes y and uh, there's also this other component u that is involved in y um, and these two things combine, x and u, combine to produce y. That's all, you know, hunky-dory, fine. That's what an ordinary linear model kind of looks like when these causal arrows are, are linear. Uh, but endogeneity says that this model um, is more complicated than this. So what I'm going to do is sort of list this here. Whoops. Uh, we've still got x causing y, uh, but now y causes x as well. Um, so, for example, it could be the case that um, economic policy influences uh, the state of growth, but the state of economic growth also influences economic policy. Um, so if we want to figure out why or how policies affect growth, we want to focus on the part of the arrow going from x to y and ignore the part going from y to x. And this can get pretty confusing because especially when these things, well, it doesn't really matter how it goes. If these things, if x causes y positively and y causes x negatively, you can get a canceling effect where it looks like there's no relationship even though there's a strong one. Um, if they go in the same direction, so x causes y positively and y causes x positively, you can uh, end up believing that X causes Y really, really strongly, even though it causes it less strongly, there's just sort of something else going on as well. Uh, and of course, it, it's common for, these, uh, for there to be sort of other things going on uh, in such a model. So I'm actually gonna go back to the red for a moment. So I'm gonna call this X1, and we might have something like you know, X2 causing Y, um, we might have, you know, another variable out here, x4 causing x1. Uh, you know, there might be some clean causal relationship between x3 and y over here. Um, and what we want to know is how do we uh, estimate a model um, that recovers the relationship between x and y, or x1 and y in this case, when we suspect there's endogeneity going on, and there's probably other things going on too, like we need to control for x2 in this case, uh, we might want to include x3 because it's relevant and so on. And in fact, uh, it's going to turn out that what we what we uh, really want is this thing right here. We want this x4, uh, which causes x1 but doesn't cause y. That's going to be of critical importance to us. Uh, but before we get to that, we should ask, okay, this is what endogeneity is. Um, why do we care? Do we care? What are the consequences of endogeneity? Uh, I alluded to them before, and uh, the short answer is, yes, we care, we care a lot, and we need to know what to do about it. So we care about endogeneity because it causes bias in our estimates of beta. Uh, estimates of the relationship between x1 and y will be biased in the presence of reverse causality between y and x1. So let me just write that down for you. Uh, estimates of the relationship between x1 and y in, in that where x1 and y are defined as in that previous causal diagram uh, will be biased in the presence of reverse causality between y and x1. 
Uh, let me show you why this is true. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a real simple model, uh, y equals x beta plus u zero. Uh, and what I'm going to do is say, okay, uh, suppose x, which is just a unitary variable, or, uh, in the, a single variable in this model, suppose x is a function of y. And in particular, suppose x equals alpha zero plus alpha one y plus alpha two z plus v. So this model here corresponds to uh, y causes x, x also causes y, and z causes x too. z is related to x as well. Uh, so and then we need to add on the error term here. Uh, well if we sort of start distributing terms, a0 beta plus a1 beta y plus a to z beta plus v beta plus u zero. Um, what we've got here is a composite error term. So v is the real, is the error um, in how z is related to y and I'm sorry, how x is related to y and z. This so v is in other words unmeasured or unmeasurable in some way. Um, and so this becomes our composite error term u, and that means that the regression of y equals x beta plus u zero involves a composite error term u right here, and u is going to be correlated uh, with beta. So, or actually, I'm sorry, it's going to be correlated with the regressors x. So the CLRM assumes that the expectation of u given x is zero. That's what we need for unbiasedness. If you were go out, if you're going, you can actually go back to that proof and, and see that. Well, uh, in this case, what we've got is the expectation of u given x equals the expectation of u zero plus v beta given x. And what's x? x is a zero plus a one y plus a two z plus v. Uh, the expectation of v beta given v is v beta. So this ends up being uh, v beta, which is not zero, which means that we do not have, by definition, this assumption of the CLRM is not true, uh, which implies that coefficients beta will be biased. Uh, and at this point, just to make a, a bit of a meta point, um, uh, this is kind of why we spent all that time going through those proofs in the beginning of the class. Um, the, nece the, the proofs are necessary because they allow us to rigorously establish the conditions under which all these qualities we assign to OLS are true. So when is beta unbiased? Um, when is beta an accurate estimate of the underlying DGP even when it's misspecified and all that? We sort of allow, that allows us to lay out the assumptions we need to make in order for those two things to be true, which in turn allows us to figure out uh, what violations of those assumptions or what problems we encounter will make these results untrue. So very often well, what we find is that some problem we encounter like endogeneity or measurement error causes there to be correlation in the error component of the regression and the regressors x. Uh, which automatically implies, even under the best conditions of a properly specified DGP, that the coefficients beta will be biased. So, in short, we have a problem with endogeneity, and it's a very significant problem because it's a bias problem, not merely an efficiency problem. So, what do you do if you have an endogeneity problem? Well, there are several things one can do. Uh, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about a quick and dirty fix that some people uh, apply when they have uh, time series cross-sectional data. So they have multiple observations over multiple times, or even if they just have a time series data set of one unit um, uh, observed over multiple times. So um, if at time t, y t equals you know, x t plus u, um, but we suspect endogeneity between x and y, uh, what we might do is instead of running this model, we might run this model instead. Uh, y t equals x t minus one, so at x at the previous time period, uh, plus u. Why would we do that? Well, we would do that for the following reason. 
if we expect that xt could cause yt and that yt could cause xt, uh, what we might say is, well, if it's the case that xt minus 1 is closely related to xt, then I use xt minus 1 as a proxy measure for xt that is in turn not itself correlated with yt because yt causes xt but it does not cause xt minus 1 because causality cannot flow backwards through time so in other words this link does not exist because uh, because of temporal <laughs> basically things can't go backwards through time so that's a quick and dirty fix that sometimes uh, some people apply um, the trick is that it actually can be the case that uh, it, it could it could be plausible that y t minus one, I'm sorry, that y t uh, could in fact quote unquote cause x t minus one. Uh, how could that be the case? Uh, well, it could be the case for the for the following reason. Uh, so obviously, this link can't exist directly in the sense that y t cannot cause x t minus one due to restrictions on time flow, but it could be the case that if I anticipate, I as an actor anticipate y is going to be at some level at time t, I might take preparatory measures to anticipate that change in y. So for example, if I think there's going to be a war, the dependent variable being war, next year I might build up my military stocks in the previous year to get ready for that war. That does not mean that my increased military stocks caused the war. It means that my anticipation of the war caused the increased military stocks. So in fact, there can be links between yt and xt minus one, and this little correction won't work. So it, this will not work uh, unless we can strictly break yt has no relationship between xt minus 1. Uh, and that often fails in the presence of strategic anticipation. So this is a, a, a correction for endogeneity that is very often applied and, and not dumb. It's not a bad idea. Um, but you need to think carefully about the conditions under which it can work. And in particular, you need to rule out the possibility, uh, the, rule out the possibility of strategic anticipation of future actions if you're going to, uh, going to think about applying this correction. So that's something sort of quick and dirty you can do. Um, and it, it works under, under, uh, under some conditions, it, it does work. Uh, but now, what do we do if we, do, we don't want to use that quick and dirty fix for example, if it's a if it's a bad idea, uh, well, you can use a, a procedure that goes uh, that's called a two-stage least squares or two SLS. Uh, it's sometimes called instrumental variables regression. Uh, what is two SLS? Well, two SLS is an approach to modeling that corrects for endogeneity uh, using uh, instrumental variables. An instrumental variable uh, is um, a variable that enables us to break the link between y and x, but preserves the link between x and y. In other words, it isolates one direction of the causal arrow. Uh, the problem in the, in the previous uh, proof, so the problem is that x and u are correlated, and that causes bias in beta, and we need to stop that from happening. So we need to we need to rid ourselves, we must rid ourselves of the portion of x that is correlated with u. That's the goal. Uh, and under the right circumstances, we can do this. And those circumstances are the circumstances under which uh, 2LS will, 2SLS will work. So let's talk uh, about um, what 2LS, 2SLS is and how it works. Uh, so step one on 2SLS. Uh, predict x 
using a variable or, or many variables that are predicting a variables. Oh, nice work. Moving on. Uh, pre <laughs> using variables that are correlated with x but not uh, with u, uh, which is to say not with y. So find a variable that predicts x and doesn't predict y. That variable is called an instrumental variable. So this is your instrumental variable. So uh, what we've got is x hat equals gamma 0 hat plus gamma 1 hat z plus v hat. That's the stage 1 regression. And z is the instrumental variable. And I should say that estimates of x hat are unbiased because Z is uncorrelated with Y, a, a predictor of X by definition. So in other words, uh, let me state this in a slightly different way. You may have noticed there's an omitted variable here. <laughs> the omitted variable is Y. We know, because we're dealing with this problem, that Y is a predictor of X. So omitted variable bias would apply if we left out Y, you might think, but that's only true if y is correlated with z. As we already discussed, if y is not correlated with z, omitting y is not harmful for our estimate of the relationship between x and z. And more, even more to the point, our prediction of x hat is still an unbiased predictor of x as long as, this, uh, as, long as there's no correlation between z and the omitted variable y. So omitted variable bias is not a problem in this case because we've chosen z specifically to be a predictor of x and not a predictor of z, uh, predictor of y. All right, step two. Uh, use x hat in place of x in the model of y. So what we've got here is y equals x beta plus u zero. Uh, so y is x hat plus v hat beta plus u zero. So in other words, I've just taken the x, which is the total component of x, and I've partitioned it into x hat, which is the part of x we can predict using our step one, our stage one uh, a model, and v hat, which is everything else left over. Uh, that's x hat, or, uh, yeah, x hat beta um, plus v hat beta plus u zero. So this v hat beta, which we um, uh, basically calculated from the previous regression, gets wrapped up into the error term. So we've got x hat beta plus u, and u is a combination of v hat beta and u zero, uh, and x hat and v hat, or I'm sorry, x hat and I should say u, u here, are uncorrelated. Now, you might want to think to yourself for a second, uncor uncorrelation, nice work, uh, uncorrelated. How do I know right now that x hat and u, which is a combination of v hat, beta, and u zero, how do I know that those things are uncorrelated? I know they're uncorrelated because of a previous proof that we uh, talked about in one of our earlier classes. So I'm going to move this down a little bit. You may recall that uh, in any regression, uh, the predicted dv, so in other words, uh, pxy, and the predicted residuals, mxy, are by definition, by construction, uncorrelated. 
So u is a combination of v hat beta. So uh, where am I here? Uh, up here. This is the first component of u. It, by construction, is uncorrelated with x hat at all. We've made it so by, by virtue of regression. u0 is the original component of this, of this model up here. Uh, and as long as we can assume that it's independently and identically distributed, the normal CLRM assumptions, it too will be uncorrelated with x. So I've got a model now where u and x are uncorrelated, and I can invoke the CLRM proofs as I did before. So I'm home free. If I can, uh, if I can implement this two-stage least squares procedure, I have no, I have broken the correlation between x and u, and I no longer need to worry about that correlation uh, as as a source of bias problems. So that's that's good. Uh, sometimes 2SLS, in fact, I would say often 2SLS uh, is implemented um, in the presence of a more complicated model than a simple model between uh, x and x and y and z. In other words, we often have more than one predictor of y, we often have more than one instrumental variable, and so on. So I'm going to just write a little bit more general uh, version of this thing I've already written. So uh, let's say y is beta 1, or uh, y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus beta 2 z plus beta 3 d plus u. Um, I'm going to say x is alpha 0 plus alpha 1 y uh, plus alpha 2 z uh, plus alpha 3 f plus v. So uh, D and F are instruments for Y and X, respectively. Uh, Z is a set of exogenous variables. That influence that there uh, that influence x and y. Give myself some more space here. Uh, so when instrumenting x, when running the first stage regression, uh, the common procedure is to use all exogenous variables which is to say z and d and f in that model so I want to use x hat equals gamma 0 hat plus gamma 1 z hat or gamma 1 hat z uh, plus gamma 2 hat d plus gamma 3 hat f plus v hat so I'm putting in everything in any model that I think is exogenous as a predictor of x. Uh, why am I doing that? Well, the reason I'm doing that is because I actually don't care about the estimates of gamma hat so much. I'm not trying to get a proper specification of x hat. All I care about uh, is that I get an accurate estimate of x hat, and uh, it turns out that uh, as long as these variables are exogenous, um, it improves my estimate of x hat without um, exacerbating the endogeneity problem, and thus my the performance of my estimates is improved. Uh, so now what I want to do is, is show you an applied example of this uh, in R and, and give you a sense of how this really works. So I've got an R script here that creates an endogenous uh, data set. Constructing an endogenous data set is actually uh, a bit of an involved procedure. Um, oh, it seems that we're going to need the SEM or simultaneous equation modeling package, which I don't currently have installed in this particular machine. So you're going to want to go in, uh, install the SEM package with all its dependencies before we get started. That should only take just a second. There we go. Uh, try it again. Bam. Everything's great. Uh, Creating an endogenous data, uh, fake data set is actually kind of hard because endogeneity uh, implies a system of simultaneous equations that have to be solved for every single observation in the presence of error. Uh, so I don't want to exactly belabor how I did this. All I want to say is I've got a data set of size 500 uh, and I constructed that data set so that 
uh, the exogenous variable uh, z is a predictor of x with a beta of 1. Uh, x predicts y with a beta of 1. y predicts x with a beta of 2. <laughs> uh, the intercept on the y model is uh, 3, and the intercept on the x model is 4. So in other words, I can write this model down. y uh, equals um, x, or uh, it's a, uh, 3, plus, uh, 3 plus x, and uh, x equals z plus 2y plus, well, I guess put the intercept first, 4 plus z plus 2y. That's what the data generating process looks like. So I've generated my data here. Uh, and if I um, try a normal model, I'm going to get highly biased results. Um, in particular, you can see that the y-intercept is way off here. Uh, and the estimate of, of the relationship between x and y is off too. Um, in particular, my estimate of the beta on x is um, 0.7. Um, that's, a, that's a bad estimate. Uh, on the other hand, if I come in and do a two-stage least squares model of, of x, so here I'm actually explicitly saying TSLS y given x comma model z. So what this is doing is TSLS y given x tells me that the model I'm interested in is the relationship between y and x. Comma squiggle z tells me, aha, the issue here is I want to use an instrumental variable z as a predictor of x. So if I come in and, and run this model, which is in the SEM package, uh, what I get is uh, 3 plus 1x, which is exactly what I should have gotten given what I told you about the data generating process. That's good. Um, that means the instrumental variable is appropriately recovering uh, the, the underlying DGP. Now suppose I have lots and lots of variables. So uh, now what I'm going to do is uh, create two instrumental variables for x, two instrumental variables for y, a common exogenous variable z that predicts both x and y. Um, and so I've got a really sort of complicated <laughs> model here. Uh, what I've got is, uh, to write this model out, I've got, uh, I've got y uh, is a function of, uh, is a function of x, m, n, and z. x is a function of y, k, l, and z. Okay, uh, so I'm going to run all this junk here, uh, and I'm going to create my data set using arcane methods that, I mean, we could discuss it at length if you like privately, but I just want to sort of spare everyone. That it, it is kind of involved to actually get this going. Uh, and if I run a standard OLS model just trying to predict y with a bunch of stuff that um, I know, I'm going to get a biased estimate of x. In particular, as you can see here, x equals 0.87. It should equal 1, as in the previous model. I've just added new stuff to the, the uh, existing model. Uh, the appropriate procedure, as I've described it, is to put everything, all exogenous variables, as instruments of x. So if I just, for example, try a two-stage least squares model using only k as an instrument of, of, of x, you can see here that if I only include one instrumental variable for x, it actually uh, chokes. The, the routine seems not to work at all. It's reporting some kind of problem with the leading principal minors. And uh, that goes for um, all of these other models I, I've tried to run, whoops, uh, where I'm not including the full suite of instruments. But if I run a two stage least squares model where I include all the exogenous variables, k, l, m, n, and z, oh, geez, uh, I get good answers. And in fact, I recover the coefficient of x, uh, which is 1, as we know in the 2J generating process, because I told you that was so, um, pretty well. Uh, so um, this sort of shows you that you really need to include all of the exogenous variables, the instruments for x, the instruments for y, and any common exogenous variables in the first stage of the TSLS regression uh, if you're going to um, implement this 2SLS, uh, sorry, not TSLS, 2SLS, uh, if you're going to implement this 2SLS uh, procedure. So you may be thinking to yourself at this point, boy, I've, I'm really excited. I have this magic bullet. 
uh, that's going to solve all my endogeneity problems? Well, not so fast. <laughs> Uh, 2SLS is, uh, it turns out, a, a troublesome procedure in the sense that uh, it's very finicky and a lot of things have to go right uh, in order for it, first of all, to even work, and secondly, for it to work in a way that's not going to do abuse to the underlying data generating process. Um, so let's talk about some of the practical difficulties, some of the many practical difficulties with implementing 2SLS as a procedure. Uh, the first practical difficulty is uh, just in finding an instrument. Um, Remember that a good instrument has to be correlated. So a, a good instrument, I'm going here. A good instrument is uh, correlated with X and not with Y. That is, uh, it turns out, a, a very tall order to, um, to meet in most applied data sets where everything is kind of related to everything uh, in some plausible way in most cases. This is so challenging to do, in fact, that debates have erupted in the substantive literature uh, over the appropriateness of instruments used in 2SLS analysis. So as an example, um, Asimolo and, and Johnson in the 2005 Journal of Political Economy use uh, colonial settler mortality rates to proxy for property rights institutions when modeling their relationship to economic growth. So let me just they make an argument that uh, settler mortality rates um, are correlated with property rights institutions that have been created for historical and sort of developmental reasons, but those same settler mortality rates are not correlated with economic growth in the present day. Uh, whether you think that's true or not, they make a little argument for it. It's a very weird thing to do in the sense of you're taking really old data, trying to relate it to uh, how institutions um, evolved over time um, and saying, you know, I think this relationship is strong enough so that I can use this ancient data, uh, piece of data as an as a instrumental variable. And it's ideal because it's not related to any economic growth things that are going on today. You get these kind of... Uh, weird arguments being made precisely because it's so hard to find anything that's correlated with the, the regressor and not with the dependent variable. So if you ever use this, be prepared to defend, first of all, to look in interesting places to find these instrumental variables, and secondly, to defend the operationalization that you make once you implement this procedure. Uh, just to make uh, every uh, everything even better, uh, even even more welcoming, there is no way to test whether this is true. It is impossible, uh, at least as currently as the procedure is currently understood, to implement a test to see whether an instrument is correlated with X and not with Y. Uh, you might think to yourself, well, sure, I can just uh, run a model where I say, uh, take an instrument of variable Z, so this is my proposed instrument, and you know, do an LM of X and Y. Uh, well, yeah, you could do that, but X and Y are collinear highly collinear, they're endogenously related, and so um, just sort of running this test is not going to give you a good answer because the correlation that X and Y are, are related enough such that we would expect both of them to be decent predictors of Z even if the underlying relationship between Y and, X, and, y and Z is, is actually zero, even if Z doesn't actually predict Y. Um, I mean, and that, that sort of goes double for, you know, you could you might think of this, uh, I could just run Z and X and hopefully the relationship between Z and Y will be zero. Well, just because the relationship between Z and Y is zero in that model doesn't mean it's not a predictor. Maybe X is just absorbing all the correlation because X and Z are supposed to be collinear, right? They're, they're designed to be collinear. Uh, so there's, there's really no way to even figure out whether uh, you've, got, um, you've got a good instrument uh, and uh, just to cap it all off, um, if you have a weak instrument, uh, so weakness of an instrument, a weak instrument is one where the correlation between Z and X, where Z is the instrument, is uh, small. Uh, the weaker the instrument is, the greater the variation in estimates, the greater the standard error in the betas that you derive out of the second stage of the procedure. 
so in other words, um, a weak instrument is going to give you highly variable results that, that might not be so great. Uh, here's a case, for example, where I've created a data set where the relationship between Z and X, which so Z is the instrument, X is the thing we're instrumenting, the beta is only 0.06. So there's, instead of what was, used to be 1, now it's 0.06, or just a tiny correlation between Z and X. If I try to implement the two-stage least squares procedure, um, it'll work, but you can see that my uh, my estimate of X is, is still, you know, it, it's bad. I mean, it's just, it's just not so good. Um, my original model is telling me X has a relationship of 0.59. Uh, we know it's supposed to be 1, so in other words, we're getting attenuation bias in this particular case. Uh, but the endogeneity correction is telling me the relationship between X and Y is 3. So in this case, it's too big. Now, in repeated sampling, it would be unbiased. We'd get you know estimates on average um, hitting, uh, hitting right around uh, 1 for that, for that beta between X and Y. But in any particular sample, the variation is going to be so great that we could be getting terrible answers. So um, if you've got a if you've got a, a sort of poorly uh, a, a poor instrument, um, you've got a problem uh, in the sense that yes, your estimates are technically unbiased, but but they're not going to be so great. Uh, they're not going to be especially useful. Um, so there's that. <laughs> uh, e uh, even worse. You have to have at least one variable that causes X and not Y in order to make this work. So uh, an, unaf an unidentified model is one in which, uh, let me go in here, uh, get my pen. Uh, an unidentified model is one in which there are uh, fewer instruments than uh, endogenous variables. So you need to have at least as many instruments uh, as you have endogenous variables if you want this procedure to actually work. Um, if, for example, we suspect that you know, W, X, and Z are all endogenously related to Y, we're going to need a separate instrument for each one of those endogenous variables in order to make a TSLS procedure work. And if we don't, we're going to have an unidentified model and uh, in short, we're not going to be able to derive meaningful beta estimates out of that model. Uh, a just identified model has exactly one instrument uh, per endogenous variable. Uh, that model will run, but as we already established in our little um, sample R script, um, more instruments is better than less in terms of getting accurate estimates of the second stage beta. In other words, accurate estimates of the relationship between X and Y. Um, and so what we really ideally kind of want is uh, what's being labeled here as an over-identified model, which is more than one instrument uh, per endogenous variable. And this uh, over-identification, so to speak, improves the performance of the estimator uh, by improving the performance of uh, x hat. So in other words, we get a better estimate of x hat, which enables us to, in turn, get a better estimate of the relationship between y and x in the second stage of the regression. Um, but as I've already told you, it's really hard to find instruments. It's even harder to find more than one, even though that's kind of how it needs to work in order to get really good estimates. Uh, so. Uh, what I'm sort of telling you here is that TL TSLS is, in theory, a, a good, reliable procedure for handling endogeneity, but in practice, it relies on your ability to do some things which are quite hard to do in an applied data set. Um, and if you try to do it anyway and you have one weak instrument for your endogenous variable, you could end up exacerbating the variance of your estimates so much that it perhaps might be better to just accept the endogeneity bias and live with it. Um, in other words, the, the cure can actually be worse than the disease in some cases. Uh, a couple of other things to think about. So uh, if the R, the R squared of the first stage regression, if R squared of the first stage regression is high, uh, then uh, 2SLS estimates 
uh, will be close to the OLS estimates. And this is the case because x hat and x, so I should say because, the x hat estimates that come out of the first stage will be very close to the observed values of x. Um, remember that r squared is the proportion of variance in a variable that's reasonably attributable or explainable by the model. If we're explaining and predicting almost all of x with our instrumental model, then we're basically just putting in x again, uh, or a very slightly modified version of x. Uh, that's good if v is small. In other words, it's good if that means that there's not a lot of error, um, quote unquote, to be correlated with x in the in the naive OLS model. Uh, the bias in our beta hat attributable to endogeneity, if you go back, is uh, it's the proof is proportional to beta v. So um, endogeneity bias is small, and there's not much of a problem to solve in in begin with to begin with. Uh, but this is this is very bad if if uh, we've got an overfitted model. So this is bad if x hat is overfitted. Remember that the point of 2SLS is to get rid of the portion of x that's correlated that, that is caused by y. Putting in a bunch of junk in the first stage regression just to predict x really well. Um, is not going to work if it gets us back the components of x that were correlated with y to begin with. So including too many instruments um, is kind of a problem too <laughs> because if you include too many of them and they're not truly instruments in the sense they're not truly correlated with x and not with y, you might end up accidentally predicting the, uh, the x hat variable just due to the fact that junk sometimes gets lucky and is able to predict a, a variable. Um, and you just get back the components of x that are affected by endogeneity, so your, your second stage estimates are bad anyway. So I, I just told you that you really want a good model of x at the first stage, but it needs to be a good model. And you can't just assess its goodness by looking at its r squared, because the higher r squared could be diagnostic of overfitting, or it could be diagnostic of the fact that the endogeneity problem wasn't that bad to begin with. So this is a pretty bad situation as it, as it goes because there are all sorts of things that can go wrong. Our normal ways of diagnosing these problems don't really work. And um, you're sort of uh, trying to navigate between the Scylla and Charybdis of um, overfitting and underspecification respectively with no guidance as to whether uh, you've done it well except for theoretical argumentation. So this is the perfect storm of um, bad things. And then, in case you needed any more evidence that 2SLS is a problematic procedure, it is consistent. So 2SLS is asymptotically valid, not valid in small samples, which means n minus k, where cap n is the number of observations and k is the number of variables, needs to be very large in order for this procedure to work. So if you tried to implement 2SLS with a lot of, with a bunch of with predictor variables in a, in a small data set, a data set size 50 or 60, uh, it's, it may not even work anyway. None of, the, none of this stuff may work anyway. It may all fall apart. So you need a large sample, an ideal, uh, uh, you need to find instruments, hopefully you need to find a lot of them, but they truly need to be good instruments. You've got to have the specification of the first stage correct and the specification of the second stage correct. You know, all these problems, in addition to all the other problems that normally one needs to think about in an OLS uh, framework, such as heteroscedasticity. Um, we still need to think about that. Multicollinearity. All these other problems are still things you need to think about. So 2SLS is, um, is the, is the uh, uh, methodological equivalent of fine china. Beautiful, elegant, not always the most practical thing. Um, you wouldn't want to take fine china camping. Um, and uh, my experience with uh, data is that uh, it's often more analogous to camping than, uh, than an elegant dinner. Um, but nevertheless, it's what we have, and, and as a wise man once said, you go to war with the, uh, with the uh, statistical models you have, not the statistical models you wish to have. 
Um, so two SLS is, is one way of handling endogeneity um, as far as it goes. Good luck. <laughs> uh, that's it for this week. Um, next week, or I'll, I'll see you next week. Um, thanks a lot.